Okay, everybody, welcome to Ancient City Poets, the uh, summer days version uh, here in the dog days of July. Um, thanks everybody for coming out on such a, a hot day. Um, I'm Amy Golden, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I'm filling uh, the very large shoes of Chris Bodor today. Um, and without further ado, um, let's go ahead and uh, now it turns out that Johnny Chicago, who wanted to be number four, is now number one, but I also have somebody who has volunteered to be number one. If, okay, so um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Colleen Jones, uh, our local uh, reporter for the St. Augustine um, record. <laughs> and uh, uh, we thank her very much. She did a wonderful piece on the Ancient City Poets uh, a while back, and we're hap happy to have her as part of the group now. So thank you, Colleen. Thank you all. Pleasure, pleasure. Um, so I love John Prine. We lost him. He was... I mean, if you all are literary musical people, he was just a major force. I admired so much the way, the, the brevity, I mean, the genius of brevity, my God, how he could just turn a phrase that would floor you in, in so much simplicity, my God. I mean, I guess it goes back to his days where he talks about, you know, growing up in, I don't know, Appalachia or something like that. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. He's one of ours. Okay, thank you. Did not know that. Um, but in any case, he had a very, just a perfect, perfect way of saying things in a very human, human accessible way that could just, I, I sometimes there's songs or lyrics that just like stop my heart. And like, those were always the songs that did that for me of his so I tried in my very lamest version to do a John Prine style poem to my friend Jim and I called the blue whale it's a tribute to my friend who um, was a graphic artist I've been a newspaper person my whole life but he was a graphic artist on the other quote side of editorial I write the words they do the pretty pictures and they do the graphics that make us all look good he was a very cre creative spirit unto himself, and he also ended up being transgender, which I found out later in life. And um, he invited me for one day to, as we were friends, and he was this big, burly guy that was a football fan, you know, Philadelphia all the way. Yeah, man, you know, throw it down. And his brothers in arms had no idea that he had that side of him. I did when he invited me one day to have tea sandwiches at his house, and I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> so this is my tribute called The Blue Whale, a tribute to Jim John Prine style. Julia drove herself an 88 night Ford pickup. She called The Blue Whale, big old kayak riding up, to, up on top, chub, chugged PBR like it was a fancy cocktail, Drove that whale all over town. Felix Edmund Ribadeau cut the engine for a women's nightgown in perfect silhouette of that one window. Julia traded PG BJs for Cuddy Sark and cut flowers for jazz funeral parades. If only a line of beautiful girls threw roses on Julia's own march to the grave. We lost him. Monday quarterbacking with the boys club as Julia sandwiches cut for tea. Her heart was as big as that whale and just as big and lost and lonely. Cause all she wanted our Julia was the blonde curls and fake eyelashes, Monroe hips and a little black dress, not another grisly sham on the fringes. Cause at home, Julia answered to Jim, his mother's given name for him. Julia, Jim, no bother for Jim was also my best friend. Thanks. 
trying to explain to my friend Jojo why Tia is acting strange. She doesn't like to think too hard these days. She acts small-minded. There's a big space in the back of her brain. She feels it every so often when she knocks her skull against the headboard when they were having sex. Ethiopia. She knows she needs to travel to Ethiopia, but no one can tell her why. Even she can't explain it as she floats from bar to bathroom to bed. Only sometimes in half sleep she remembers. She read in a newspaper somewhere. They are dying too. She wants more moccasins, braids, wore a bun, slept with Mona Lea. Now she salutes a bar stool. Sleeps beside Captain Jack. Swears it's only dream she finds the sun they shot at on Canyon Bay. Knows her bones need to lie down. Lie down one last time inside Mauna Lea. All right, this is my edgy one. All right, you all ready? I like to have fun with this one. The first time I saw my hamster's dick. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that pregnant was. The first time I saw my hamster's dick, I was shocked, repulsed, and compelled all at the same time. I mean, I was only 11. The little hamster penis was red, so very red and projectile, like a tiny plastic meat thermometer popping out of my furry little pet. It was so gross and weird. I, I, I remember thinking it didn't even look like it belonged on his body. It was the first penis I had ever seen. We never had a dog growing up, so I had never seen the male organ of a dog in heat humping up against my leg, but back to my hamster. The first time that ugly little bright red rod jutted itself out of my cute, cuddly baby hamster, I wanted to turn away, but I couldn't. Somehow I felt like I was invading his nakedness. I know, I know, he was doing this little hamster creature, cleaning, doing his manic ritual, licking fur, then ribbing his tiny paws over the fur to dry with lightning speed. He was doing his business, and I was invading his space in some way. I continued to watch him clean a few minutes more. My eyes through the clear glass cage fixed curiously on his still erect male organ. Then I turned and walked away. It would be years before I saw another live penis. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. I would imagine after the hamster, it was everything was a wonderful surprise after that, if that was the first one. <laughs> um, it has to get better. That's right. Uh, okay, so next, uh, we've got directly from the big green chair, Johnny Chicago. Yay. Oh, I truly appreciate your nod towards John Prine. Um, all of us. Um, native Chicago creatives named John see him as one of our patron saints, so I do appreciate that. Um, this is called Scraping Out the Food, and it's a poem with a prologue, and the prologue goes, She protested, a $1 can opener will work like a $1 can opener. He expected perhaps not praise, at least gratitude for bringing home the new utensil, said, maybe... One dollar worth of can opener is all that's needed. Scraping out the food. Proper can opener usage remains academic in acquisition. A taught learned legacy for openers, both electric and manual. Scraping out the food that remains in the can after the initial food dump, however, is an instinct best left to muscle memory in a thwarting of cohesive anisha. Go ahead, fool. Risk the food sprayage of a can shake, a can slap, a wrist flickery is laughable. The more adhesive the food mock these staccato efforts marinate in a sneering wreath of unhealthy, overweight American food waste. 
and lose the fey limerence of one rubber spatula. The right angle of can wall to can base defies the sharpest of spatula corners. And what of the wall's ribbing? Answer that. And what of and what of the vicious jagged metallic edge left by proper can opener usage? A lampreic bracelet impossible to pass through unsliced save for all but the smallest of human hands. Go ahead, fool. Risk exsanguination into that evening's meal prep. And what of and what of and what of anything but canned tomato products and canned cherries and canned beets and anything else that's not red and lustily will do nothing to conceal the bloodletting. The one dollar can opener, the jagged edge, the initial food dump, the ribbed sides. He expected perhaps not praise, wielded a rubber spatula to the full extent of spatulaness. He expected at least gratitude, inserted a too large hand into the can's deadly gaping Maw now, vibrant red drops drip, drip, drip from his too large hand, sit like crimson polka dots atop the surface of the creamy canned Alfredo sauce. Thank you. Uh, I want to do one of my favorites. This one actually. Um, Made it to the pages of Folio once. That's about an adventure I had in the drive through line of a fast food place. Maybe not an adventure, but an epiphany, a happening. And it's called Burger King Girl. It's odd how I began by hating you, Burger King Girl. I was looking for dinner fast, cheap, and unhealthy. Instead, I found desire. Was it a fortunate right turn which allowed me to beat you to the drive-up line, or perhaps an afterburner brought you to the speaker box before me? You were more, no more than a tempo GL to me, Burger King girl, just the most immediate obstacle between me and my food. And what the obstacle? Was it you? Was it them? Don't tell me you sent them back three times for more ketchup. Or do you need no more tomato? Did you change your mind about the size of the just water, please, you asked for? And what was it that made you take so damn long at the window ahead of me? Time ticked away, and I began to court fury. The car radio is currently broken, and it's stuck on only one station, and the station is Christian country music. My empty stomach threatens angstation. I am hungry. Are you are in my way, Burger King girl? Time ticked away. The earth is turning. I feel I have moved to a different position in relation to the cosmos since you got to that window. The sun has sunk lower in the western sky since you got to that window. Late afternoon shadows Venetian, the trees, and the sun struck strikes an angle and it slices through your moonroof and it strikes the rearview mirror and in a blinding flash all my anger is seared away for I am suddenly blessed with the reflection in the mirror of your eyes. Those eyes, those eyes inviting, flirtatious, eyes shaped like almonds I shaped like glistening silver dollar fish, shaped like glistening silver almond fish dollars. They call to me. They sing my favorite songs. I see them glisten, and I am no longer thinking of food. I am feeling a different kind of hunger. Just who are you, Burger King girl? Where do you go when you're not blocking my way? Do you eat french fries at dusk? Dunk your breaded chicken sticks among the ocean breezes. Who closes those eyes with the soft, sweet, deep-fried bouquet of a fish nugget? But whatever the problems, solved. And you shifted to drive and drove away from the window. And now... Every greasy bite of fast food carries me back to the moment the sun first showed me my Burger King girl. Every French fry is your long, thick lashes. Every artificially flavored milkshake is the amount of time you made me wait behind you. Up to a lonely midnight sky, I hold an egg and cheese croissant to your memory. I am ODing on Burger King drive through in hopes of once again being faced with your rear bumper. My cholesterol is through the roof, but still I drive, still I eat fast food, still I long with all my heart and all my soul and all my arteries to once again look 
into the reflection of the eyes of my Burger King girl. Thank you. I got one more. Um, I have a publishing house called Happy Taper Press, and I publish local artists, and I publish my zine, Happy Taper. And <clears throat> recently came out with issue number seven in Bandanorama, which is right here, available on Etsy, or for me right here. Um, $3 also gets you a free bandana with every purchase. Um, but I want to read something from there. Um, this is the chapter called, In Bandanorama, I Started Dating Three Women. And I want to read you the middle of this. Um, I worked for a while at California Pizza Kitchen. And I ended up dating three of my customers at California Pizza Kitchen. And this is about one of them. <clears throat> Elle called the restaurant to ask me out. After I had waited on her and her friend and her friend's baby, she was impressed, <coughs> excuse me, and heartened by the way I interacted with the baby despite its one hideously deformed hand, which Elle described as a seething mass of tendrils and fins. Now I do remember talking to the baby, do not remember seeing any Cthulhu type appendage, and to be honest, I really didn't remember Elle until the, well until we met the next week for our first date. She worked down in the Loop and lived out in the far west burbs, so our dating activities were centered down around apartment three in the Loop. And maybe we should have kept to that, because the first time we went out to her neighborhood was the last day of our time together, because that was the day she took me into her bedroom, and I made a wholly inappropriate comment when I saw that on the end table next to her bed, she had a bowl of condoms that I don't remember exactly what I said, pales in scope of significance in contrast to any fathomable reason why I would say what I did. Why would I do something so chauvinistic to make so unduly and so judgmental a comment on a woman's personal life? It was most certainly misogynist to think it was my place to deem a woman's sex activities and safe sex activities at that to be untoward and worthy of my reaction. How disgustingly patronizing as well. Not to mention the double standardizing of it. Would it warrant a similar reaction where I have seen a man have a bowl of condoms next to his bed? But you have to understand that when I said there was a bowl of condoms, I don't mean a bowl like a soup bowl, but a bowl as in a, a round glass fish bowl, the big round spherical type, round clear glass with a relatively small opening near the top. <coughs> and big is relative to for as far as fish bowls went, this was like really, really big, like standard beach ball size big, or maybe even close to large yoga ball big, like perhaps even a 24 inch diameter, big glass spherical goldfish bowl filled to almost the very top with condoms. It was the only thing on the end table because nothing else would fit on the end table. This was less a bowl of condoms and more a giant globular glass capsule for which condoms provided a kaleidoscopian filler every brand and color and shimmer, every possible configuration of the little foil square or rectangle or circle numbering the thousands, the tens of thousands. My first apartment girlfriend, W, was an accountant for a condom manufacturer in Chicago. And one day she took me on a tour of the plant where I saw the mass production of condoms and I saw the volume taken up by 500 condoms, and I saw the volume taken up by 1,000 columns, and I swear this giant bedside Jupiter must have held nine or 10 or 12 of those 1,000 condom volumes. So whatever it was I said was said not in response to seeing condoms next to a woman's bed, but was in response to walking up on a clear orb the size of the Imperial Death Star filled with more condoms than any man should be allowed to see in one place at one time, and like Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness character, Danforth, who was singularly witness to the ultimate truth of the universe, I too went mad, albeit only momentarily, 
when I said what I said. But no matter the reason, what I said was bad enough to make her and us right then and there break up. She didn't even take me back into the city, but after all that, just dropped me off at the nearest train station. Thank you. <laughs> all righty. <laughs> I know it's I think uh, this is this is kind of fun. Okay, Holly, come on down. Hi, I'm Holly. I I tried to stick to the theme, so most of what I wrote I wrote when I was about ten, and they're a little more innocuous. Although I do have experience with hamster organs and nerve damage from the can opener uh, from the from a can of chicken and. I actually know very little about condoms. I had two children by the time I was 23. <laughs> anyway. And I still don't know which ones of these I'm going to read. I'm just going to shuffle and see what happens. <laughs> these are the days when the sun melts the moon, so it rises dripping, pale, glittering gold. The kind of moon under which great stories are told, inspiring hearts to grow bold. This is the time when the grass grows taller than the hedges, when the world takes on a hazy glimmer about the edges, and men are wont to make outrageous pledges. It is the season of riotous afternoon rainfalls, when I can't quite hear whose name the wind calls, and even wet streets gleam like marble halls. At this hour, bullfrogs serenade from the lake. Diminutive birds take over at daybreak. I walk about dreaming, though fully awake. <laughs> Beach backwash blues, sea shanty muse, sea glass, salt grass green, strange change I have seen. Porpoise point, pirate plunder. I still sal salvage sail pens from ships taken under. Marsh, mangrove, magic, and manatees, sad sweet song of cypress trees. Nice. Uh, this one is called Questions for a Pelican. I see you first as I lie by the seaside. I watch you gracefully dip and glide heedless of the rip and the tide. Are you a pelican or a pelicant? Can I tell by the way you fly at a slant? I want to fly too, but I know I shan't. How do you fly in a perfect dancer's line? Do your wings feel heavy, covered in brine? Would you trade your wings for these arms of mine? <laughs> This one's called Chakmul. If you don't know, Chakmul is a, a Mayan water god. <laughs> I put a Chakmul by my swimming pool so it wouldn't go dry in the heat of July. I complain when it starts to rain. He says, how do you think I keep the pool full? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. La, 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 la. Okay, this is Island Song. In my dreams, the native beat echoes the rattling, rustling palms, waves reaching up to the moon who guides them, then tumbling to the sand, shifting with the breeze. The island night remembers religion of long ago, sweet scented blossom offerings for the gods to bring us fish, fruit, protect us from the wrathful storm, dancing our bodies in undul the undulating rhythm our ancestors taught us alive in our soul, a, a celebration. <laughs> Sorry. I'm steeped in the southern sun as much as the tea on the back porch. I spear it and walk with it as a torch. I harness the hurricane's great wind. She knows I won't break, only bend. Kin to the ocean's steady roar. I bubble up like sea foam returning to shore. 
I can bring forth life from the sand, cradle it in the palm of my hand. It winds around me, a honeysuckle vine, sweet, but it won't let me forget that it's mine. I'm in love with the convergence where the, the inlet and ocean meet. I feel the sand rise and settle under my feet. Best seen when the sun lowers to set the whole world aglow and dolphins and pelicans rehearse their dinner show. The river fed brack mixes with brine, forever joining in a single swerving line. I stand in the wind with one leg in each, part of the water and part of the beach. Mm -hmm. All right. And this is usually appropriate in the afternoon. <laughs> Dark clouds curl around the summer sky like Spanish moss. Electric lightning flowers blooming, spreading their vines across. Fat drops slap slipping down on duckweed in the marsh, lazily first with parachutes, then machine gun fire harsh. I wish the wind would pick up so I could dance with the trees, but there's not the slightest hint of a breeze. If it gets any more humid, I know I can breathe water full mermaid. Puddles are no longer for splash, but a knee deep wade. Even the sugar cranes lift their long legs high in the brackish muck. Mockingbirds still fly from tree to tree, testing their luck. The sky itself shudders and quakes, loosening the silted, stilted shacks of cypress shakes. Then, as if nothing happened, the sun reappears, dries the wet earth, a dad who wipes away tears. <laughs> okay, I'll do one more. Sunrise surf, pink, orange sunrise, reflects on the water. I paddle out, one with the ocean rising up to my board on calm green glass, devoid of innate grace or skull. I let the current carry me to the height of our moon's pool, then flying like a fish among the breakers careening to the shore. Okay. Gotta love somebody who does a poem about surfing. <laughs> Uh, next, we have the wonderful Mary Yeck. Okay, well, we've had a lot of fun this afternoon so far, and I'm sorry to break the mood, but I have a pandemic poem, and uh, one other uh, on the fires in the West, and then I will end with something a little bit more cheerful. Hallucination two. I see them walking toward me on rivers of light. The green shoots of unlived days trail from their shoulders. Their hands are lined with script, stories of lives unread. The horizon wavers, shrinks. They disappear behind the boundaries prescribed by astronomy and physics. They reappear on narrow beds, hidden behind the masks and gloves of caregivers who now obscure their bodies from those who watch through windows of a generation and long to touch what is forbidden. Warmth, the pulse of blood, delivering breath to lungs devoid of air. Images fade into the waking world and merge with what we do not wish to see. <clears throat> Thank you in the desert. 
Daylight creeps over the city limits, bringing drought, wind, fire to an exhausted landscape. All along the wavering lines of roadways, machines move in to clear the charred remains of habitation. Under the eerie light of skies tinted with smoke, shadows return to forage amidst the wreckage, move on. There is thunder without rain, lightning with the threat of flames over ground still warm but turned to ash. When we built, how could we know what storms would do? Our eyes were closed to the resentments of forests. Our ears were closed to the whispered threats of wind. What did we know of elemental forces determined to reclaim their own? Okay, cheerful. <laughs> Estuary with herons. The world's green lung coughs, clears itself, breathes under a red sunrise. On the beach, a child who wants to be a bird works sharpened scapulae. She watches the herons spread their wings, lift off. Her curls feather to a crest above her head. She runs, falls, becomes a woman. The crest fans out catches the sun's rays. Burnt umber falls over her shoulders. The hint of feathers disappears into the skin of a lioness, sun gold, sensuous. The window where her heart should be is humid, cloudy. Inside a child riding a heron soars above the estuary. Thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you, Mary. Lovely. Um, next, we have the inimitable Natalie Beltrami. Come on down. <laughs> so. I, uh, it's kind of a strange assortment here. This I actually wrote after going to the Casa Monaco on Friday night <laughs> and listening to, uh, this, uh, wait a minute, and listening to a group called the House Cats, and they, 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 I, they didn't pay me anything to do this anyway, but he, they're very good. And, uh, I've been a jazz fan for a long time. This is called, as you might imagine, jazz. The notes break the bars, stretching them, pushing them this way, that way, out of the confines of convention, escaping the imprisonment of the page, of the past, the precise, of the studied arrangement of one, fleeing to find magnificent multi-manifestation in the many, fugitives, abandoning their maker, emerging from the loins of the moment, slipping off the end of the saxophone, sliding across the strings of the guitar, throbbing, lure, throbbing, luring the bass to come out of hiding, cajoling the drums to pulsate, undulate, inundate, all together twisting and turning the air, tantalizing truculent toes, loosening hips, stroking shoulders, seducing body and spirit in the writhing rhythm of the orgiastic, fantastic, elastic now. This is just a little ditty, and I, I actually woke up the other morning with three poems in my head, and or wherever part, part, poems emerge. Um, I don't know if I'm going to read you the other one because it's a political one. Anyway, this is called 
This is an acknowledgement, a confession. My precious I, my precious eyes jingle and jangle in my brain, filling my mouth and my pages, ubiquitous where my focus is, invasive, pervasive, echoing in my ears so loudly I cannot hear you. This is about my mother. My mother was an amazing woman. She lived to be 97 years old, and there was good reason for that. But I was determined always to do the opposite of whatever she told me to do. <laughs> Called Legacy. It is a little piece of pottery, carefully selected by my mother, to heat her butter, now part of a legacy to me. Did she not remember her own admonitions about the perils of butter? Butter, the profligate bearer of cholesterol, willing accomplice in all assaults against heart, veins, and brain. So why did my mother have a special container embellished with delicate little flowers, purchased for the express purpose of heating butter. Carefully stashed in a safe corner of her cupboard, next to the vitamins and red yeast rice. Was it a symbol of her rebellion? Her fragile weapon against stern voices preaching servants, servants of good health extolling the virtues of self-discipline? Was this her clandestine link with the enemy? Licking its lips in the dark shadows of self-indulgence? I never saw her use it. <laughs> I smile to think of her secret pleasure watching the forbidden golden liquid bubble with luxurious abandon in this little ceramic crucible, just as I do now. <laughs> and this is my last one. Just a little tease, because I haven't done it for a long time. And I started out actually, well, I've always written poetry, but I started out writing children's poetry. And I need to go, oh my God. But anyway, I'm going to read you a children's poem. It's called Supper Stars. That man in the moon has some appetite. I think that he munches on stars each night. At times every month, he is small and slim. In fact, just a sliver is left of him. But then, Two weeks later, I've noticed that the man in the moon has gotten, has gotten quite round and fat. And after he grows to be so full and bright, it seems to me there are less stars out at night. There isn't much else he could eat in the sky, no place where that a fellow could go out and buy a shake or some fries or a nice candy bar, so he must be eating those poor little stars. But I guess that he must get to feeling so bad, so guilty about that big feast that he had, that he goes on a diet like Mom always does, so he can be slivery slim like he was. But just like my mom, he can't seem to be, decide whether he wants to be small or be wide, because after he's finished with losing those pounds, he's back eating stars till once more he is round. Thanks, Natalie. I think we have a we have a real. What's that? The inimitable. 
<laughs> right. I, I, th I think we have a, uh, a, food, uh, a food theme going on today. Um, next up, we have Cassandra Baker. Come on down, Cassandra. Thank you. Um, I'm Cassandra, and I haven't done this in a while, long time. I think I was Zooming for a few times. And um, I just have a few short poems on my phone. So I'm going to start with this one. Okay. I don't want wishy-washy. No. Nor do I desire lukewarm. When the buzzards start to swarm, then I see the norm. New visions begin to form. The silver edges the storm. Dormant varmints reborn. Oh, I'm having trouble seeing my phone for some reason. Dormant varmints reborn, clawing for the lights reflected behind my mascaraed eye. The warmth detected by the walking dead I freely offer to assist. Take my hand and see my pain. To heal, my tears come fresh. I do not wish to repeat the test. Your road is your own, your power, your throne. Bejeweled is my crown. I worship, yes, I bow. In prayer, I come around to God in reverent sound. Okay. Um, I wish I had my glasses. <laughs> I don't think I have them. They're in the car, sorry. Um, I don't usually have this much trouble. What's that? Um, oh, hold on. Okay, you're right. Hold on. No, I can't. Not, not in that section. Okay. Do you have glasses? Yeah. Okay. Ah, oh, that's much better. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, this one's called New Canvas. Each day brings new canvas, a fresh slate gessoed clean, a chance to paint strokes, not just black and white, as I blend the colors, sketching my dreams into reality, leaving my past to rest, taking my thoughtful time to perfect the shadows and the lines. Thankful I can read the signs, soulful tears left behind. I can be sure of God's grace. No matter what future unfolds, I'm in his hands. In this life that I will face, each hurdle, each blessing leaves his faithful trace. This masterpiece I cannot erase. I am in this rightful place. Thank you. All right, I just have one. This is the newest one. This is from February. Waking up in the vortex of last night's reverie, my morning memories consume. Consciously, I have to make room for po positive thought process, put my resolve to the test. Let simple gratitude resume, purposely let go of the doom. Cut ties with any gloom. Grab hold of my eminent dream. Staying fast on the beam, it's not just a funny meme. Inside of me is a capable team, a working order of self-esteem. Letting go of trepidation and fear, my God, he keeps me near. The vibration of success I hear. I can see it now that it's in reach. Go on life, resume to preach. I'm willing to absorb your teach. Take in the beauty of each blessing you have in store. And yes, I want more. Very, very nice. Um, next up, we've got the man, the myth, the legend, Lee Weaver. <laughs> Oh, 
Nan, 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 Nan what'd you say to do first? I'm sorry? You told me to do one thing first. The poem. The, oh, all right, all right. This is a, <clears throat> this is a poem. It's entitled, I'm Through Writing Poems, <laughs> by Lee Weaver. I'm through writing poems. I can't make them rhyme. They don't make any sense. It's just a waste of time. Punctuation is a puzzle, stanzas aren't my fort. I try to make them mean something, failing I abort. And then there's folks who read them, they must think that I'm a dope, going on about mercy, love, and rainbows, and most of all, about hope. No more waxing poetic with a rhyming dictionary. I'll put my mind to something grand and become a missionary. I'll preach mercy, love, and rainbows. I'll tell them all about hope. No, wait, that's what I did before, but now you see it doesn't rhyme. <laughs> the rhyming's no big deal. The thoughts are all that count, so I'll go back to my keyboard and my sermon on the, no, my poem on the mount. <laughs> oh, please, please. Please. More applause for that. All right, now this is, uh, some of you know that I'm, I'm a playwright. I've actually got 12 plays that I perform around the country. And this one I did uh, four weeks ago, uh, two sold out performances. So was, now that's, uh, the place only sat 50 people, so. <laughs> but they were sold out both nights. and. Uh, it's called Piercing the Darkness, and it's about the uh, lighthouse that we have over on the island, and it's very informative. It starts out talking about Ponce de Leon, 1513, oops, and it goes right up to the present. It's music, it's funny, it's history. You, you learn things in there, like uh, how many steps are there going up in the lighthouse? 219, uh, how many bricks are in the lighthouse? Two million bricks, and if you were to take all those bricks out and stretch them one after another, one after another, allowing perhaps a half inch for the mortar between the bricks, they would stretch from the lighthouse all the way over to the, the outlets, the outlets. Isn't that something? They go that. No, I'm kidding. They wouldn't. If you, if you laid them end to end, they'd go all the way up to the avenues. No, I'm not telling the truth about that either. If you laid them, if you laid them end to end, and this is the truth, they would reach all the way up to Savannah. There's two million of them. You can do the math. Eight and a half, half for the mortar plus the brick, reach all the way to Savannah. Now that's as the pelican flies. Uh, the, if the pelican had to go over to you know 95 and the, all that up there. But as the pelican flies, who who is talking about the pelican? Who who did that? Yes, 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 yes. A wondrous bird is the pelican. His beak can hold more than he can hold in his beak enough food for the. But I'm darned if I know how the hell he can. Yes, 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 yes. Well, anyway, <laughs> this is a, a little song. Well, it, it's not quite finished. Uh, you have to help me. Um, I'm going to sing the chorus one time for you so you see how it goes. And I don't know how to play the ukulele. So <laughs> just pretend you're hearing song uh, notes that make sense. And I'll, I'll, sing, I'll, I'll sing the verse and then I'll do a song and then you'll do the verse after me, right? Okay, here we go. Come up the steps of the lighthouse with me. Come up, see the lamp shine over the sea. We'll search for, we'll search for, <laughs> they fear the lost, but I know they're found. You know, this would have been easier for all of us if I put this up here. Can any of you see that? That's all right. There we go. Whoops. Here, Amy, you got to help me with this. Here, you're my, my stage crew. There we go. Thank you. Now, the, the first verse goes, here's the first verse, and you're going to sing, you're going to sing the uh, chorus with me, all right? It goes, from the horizon, it's a beautiful sight. 
Towering upward, black and white, red top against sky, white and blue. It looks like old glory. Oh, what a view. Isn't that simple right now? Do it with me one time. All right, here we go. Come up the steps of the lighthouse with me. Come up, see the lamp shine over the sea. We'll search for sailors and ships run aground. They fear they're lost, but we know they're found. Oh, oh, we're going to sing the verse, uh, the chorus after each verse, all right? There, there's 14 verses. Here we go. Oh, from the horizon, it's a beautiful sight. Towering upward, black and white, red top against sky, white and blue. It looks like old glory, oh, what a view. Oh, come up the steps of the lighthouse with me. Come up, see the lamp shine over the sea. We'll search for sailors and ships run aground. They fear they're lost, but we know they're found. Oh. Twelve more verses. Wait, is there a baby Here we go. Don't look down. I kid it about. There's not that many verses. Wait, is there like a verse? <laughs> no, this is it. Oh, don't look down. You might get dizzy. Get up those steps. We gotta get busy. Bring up the oil, but first get it hot. Careful, don't spill it. We need every. There you are, you did it. Oh, come up the steps of the lighthouse with me. Come up, see the lamp shine over the sea. We'll search for sails and ships run aground. They fear they're lost, but we know they're found. Oh, steps going up number 219 for the prettiest sight that you have ever seen. Look to the north, south, East and west, difficult to say which view is best. Oh, 12 more verses. Come up the steps of the lighthouse with me. Come up, see the lamp shine over the sea. We'll search for sailors and ships run aground. They fear the lost, but we know they're found. Oh, the Fresnel lamp. Here's them. the Fresnel lamp. That's the name. Fresnel is the name of the French uh, guy who built the lens that goes into the greatest first order thing. And the first name, there'll be a prize if anybody can tell me. The first name of Fresnel is? George. No. Pierre. No. Francois. No. <laughs> His first name is, are you ready? Jacques. <laughs> no. His first name is Augustine. Yeah, yeah, okay. So here's, here's, the, here's the last verse. Uh, this is the last verse. Hold your applause. Please. Oh, the Fresnel lamp was made in France. Careful, do not touch it. We can't take the chance. It cost a lot of money, that's no lie. It's the very best lens that money can. Oh, come up the steps of the lighthouse with me. Come up, see the lamp shine over the sea. We'll search for sailors and ships run aground. They fear they're lost, but we know they're found. Oh, they fear they're lost, but we know they're found. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The clutter. Yes, the clutter. Oh, I didn't tell you. Yeah, the, uh, 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 there's some humor in the play, too. You know, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, pirate jokes. My favorite one is uh, the, the pirate captain walked into a bar and he had a paper towel on his head. And the bartender said, what's going on there? You got a paper towel on you? He said, Arr, they put a bounty on me. <laughs> thank you, Lee. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so that brings us to the conclusion of our uh, poetry readings today and all our multimedia entertainment. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, 
the gallery, the Butterfield Gallery, the Art Box, uh, for providing a wonderful space for us today. And uh, thank you to Ken for your assistance and help. And thank you so much to Clay. Thank you, Clay. And um, so now in true kamikaze style, I, following Lee Weaver, I have just one little hot, sultry summer poem called Mile Marker Zero. The sun slides out of its blanket of faint morning stars and languidly reveals itself, a brazen red hibiscus blossom. Wild parrots chatter. Hardtack captains make ready their vessels, one eye on the sky, one on the water. Cafe doors open, sidewalks redolent of cafecito, warm mango pastelitos, the ubiquitous tang of salt, a tinny bell rings heralding the first tourist trolley rolling onto Duval Street's steaming asphalt. A pair of sunburned honeymooners shuffle to the counter to clutch a morning cup with shaky hands. A disheveled drag queen nurses a latte in the corner. The barista understands. Her sachet abandoned in the dawn. Smeared lipstick on a 5 a.m. shadow. A large manicured hand daintily stifles a yawn. Entitled cats lounge and preen in the shady garden of the big white house, eyeing the wrought iron table where raucous ghosts drink rum and pen their rough drafts. The cats stretch their six-toed claws, casting disdainful side eyes at the tourists snapping their photographs. The island stretches, warming bleached coral bones in the sun, shaking off its hangover to prepare this new day's carnival. What's done is done. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next, next time, and have a wonderful Sunday.